From Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number three, recorded on November 24th, 2015. Hello, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast about the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels LD. Hello there, Vincent and Tuivo World. How are you doing? It's been a month since we last spoke. It has. I'm doing really well. It's been a, a great month. So some travel and some action in the laboratory as well. So I actually visited one of our um, TWIV colleagues or TWIV associated colleagues, Sarah Sawyer, who just moved her lab recently mm -hmm. to the University of Colorado Boulder, gave a seminar uh, there and saw her new digs at the BioFrontiers Institute. Really nice. cool setup there. Yeah. Visited her in Austin when she was there a couple of years ago. Oh yeah. Sarah, of course, was on TWIV. Even longer than that ago, at an ASV episode, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. I think up in Madison, Wisconsin, if I'm remembering. Yes, that's correct. Now, uh, Boulder is a lovely place, isn't it? Oh, really nice. Um, and so this BioFrontiers Institute, this is uh, run by Tom Chuck. So he was mm -hmm. um, pretty famous in terms of his Nobel Prize winning work on uh, RNA catalysis, and then he was president of HHMI for a number of years and has returned back to Boulder to head up this institute that's a um, great new building, lots of energy, very multidisciplinary. So mm -hmm. faculty in physics, math, biology, virology, kind of all over the place. And um, yeah, it was really fun to plug in for a day or two and see what they're up to. I bet Boulder is a kind of place where you'd love to be. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, Vincent. So the mountain doing science in the Mountain West, whether it's Boulder or Salt Lake or a few other spots around here, is really, really fun because yeah. you have, I think, this nice combination of sort of beautiful landscape all around you and outdoor opportunities, and then these great communities of scientists that are sort of active, outgoing, and it's it's really a great place to be. Now, Boulder is a bit smaller than Salt Lake, right? That's correct. So, and you're, you know, you're about a good hour from Denver and certainly mm -hmm. the, the airport there. So it does feel like a bit of a smaller community. Salt Lake, we're kind of dropped into the foothills, but the city is also dropped in the foothills. And so um, with a slightly bigger footprint, so mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the advantages there as well. Yeah, I visited Boulder a few years ago. I like it a lot. Yeah, that me would, too. Uh, that would be a place where if I were to do my whole career over, that's a good place. I hear you. You know, a lot of good science, and you can, it's small enough that you can find your colleagues and interact with them. I was just telling you in the pre show that here at Columbia, I don't see my colleagues because everyone is scattered all over the place where they live. Mm -hmm. A few people live in Manhattan, but they live way downtown, about mm -hmm. a mile downtown. So I don't see anybody, and it's unfortunate because campus life is good, it's rich, and a lot of fun to talk with your colleagues and meet them at off campus and do things and talk about work or whatever. And I, I don't have that. So it's kind of too bad. Yeah. Although I think there are some good things for uh, New York in terms of the opportunities, the cultural, incredible um, oh, yeah, of energy of the city. Yeah. Well, I, I lived in New York. My wife and I lived here for, I don't know, seven years or so when I first came to Columbia <clears throat> then we then we left. But uh, that was great. Uh, it was, it's a lot of high energy stuff. You walk out on the street and you just feel the energy. That's the cool thing about living here, you know? Yeah. The few times I've visited, I've sort of felt that you can really tap into it. That's really cool. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a lot of people here and it's pretty expensive and, um, <laughs> there's no, not much privacy. <laughs> so um, right now in my life, I don't want to do that anymore, but it was a lot of fun at the time. Yeah. I hear you. All right. You know, uh, Nels, we do have a follow-up, even though we haven't yet published this podcast. This yeah. is episode three. Uh, we have a follow-up, and it came about in an unusual fashion. Mm. On the last episode, we talked about uh, the cellular protein ApoBec as a potential source of mutation in HIV. Yeah, I remember. It's a long time ago. 
<laughs> and I thought that merited a blog post. I also blog uh, about viruses at virology.ws, and I figured this is a good one, and you know, I read it for the podcast, so I often do double duty. Yeah. And uh, one of the readers of my blog happens to be John Coffin. Great. <laughs> who you great, must know. <laughs> great virologist, great HIV biologist, yes. Yeah, so he's down at, uh, actually he, he splits his time between Tufts University and uh, the NIH. Mm -hmm. And we did a twiv with John, and at the end we talked about his cranberry farm, which is a hobby for him. Oh, wow. Did you know that he uh, farms cranberries? No, I didn't know that. Yes, he uh, he grows them, and they're interesting because, um, you know, to harvest them, you flood the field, and they float, and you just go and you pick them off. But he hires people to do all this, and then he sells the cranberries to companies like uh, Ocean Spray. You know, they make those, they make juice, and they make dried cranberries. Yeah, sounds like a great <laughs> hobby. Growing, you know, growing up in Minnesota, and then going to grad school in Chicago, I would drive through Wisconsin, which is sort of one of the cranberry capitals. And so we would see some of the, you'd see some of the fields, the um, you know, Ocean Spray, I think, owned fields, or they, the farmers were selling their cranberries as well. Yeah, I love cranberries. Anyway, John Coffin wrote, with respect to my blog post, but I thought we could talk about it here. Yeah, a great idea. Talk about it. So this was a um, paper published in PLOS Biology called Extremely High Mutation Rate of HIV-1 in Vivo. Yeah, and maybe just to quickly refresh um, my memory as much as anything else. But So this is a paper that was pretty provocative in the sense that it looked at sort of a, a new way of examining the mutation rate in HIV. Um, and we were using that in Twivo number two to highlight sort of the idea that, well, first of all, to raise the um, uh, sort of fundamental principle of mutation rates as being kind of the bread and butter of evolution. And then from there, the idea that measuring these things is sometimes easier said than done and can be relative depending on sort of the situation that these, um, in this case, the viruses that are evolving through uh, rapid point mutations accrue these mutations. And so I think what John Coffin, when he saw your um, blog post, uh, is even pointing out how uh, hard it can be to get a handle on the mutation rate in some cases. So actually he started his email by saying, I'm afraid you got taken in on this one. <laughs> I love it. I, I felt very badly. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't like to be taken in. We like oh, to think sure. that we can sort things out. I thought it was a cool story, but he writes, the role of apobec in retrovirus mutation has been well known for at least a decade, and the observation of much more frequent hypermutation in viral DNA than in plasma virus RNA is commonplace. We have seen this in almost every patient we have looked at and would never have thought it worth remarking on except in passing. I predicted that defective mutant proviruses should accumulate in cell DNA in my essay in science 20 years ago. The fact is that it is impossible to calculate mutation rates from these kind of data, except to say they are greater than zero. <laughs> <laughs> I love that sentence. Current. And what a way to really put an exclamation point <clears throat> on how hard it can be in some scenarios to, you know, to really define a mutation rate. And then imagine, you know, this is sort of a key um, uh, measurement for a lot of population genetics, a lot of evolutionary genetics. And so... You know, I think this really nicely highlights that in terms of where we are as a field, um, especially in some of these cases of these viruses, is it's really hard to nail that down. Where someone who here, who's John Coffin, who's a great HIV virologist with all kinds of, um, you know, more than 20 years of experience, as he points out, thinking about this, um, will, <laughs> will only go as far to concede that the mutation rate is greater than zero. He, he basically says that um, in vivo, most cells infected with non-defective proviruses make virus, they die within a day or two, but cells that get highly defective proviruses, especially due to apobec 3 g which changes just about every tryptophan codon to a stop codon, can survive for much longer times. The result is that cells with defective proviruses have much longer lifetimes, and over thousands of replication cycles can become a large fraction of the infected cell population, even if the underlying rate is small. Given that hypermutations are the result of apobec molecules that escape the action of VIF and end up in virions to exert their effect in the next infected cell, 
They are not distributed randomly, but are clustered on a few proviruses. Since intact gag genes are needed to make virions, it's no surprise that the frequency of hypermutation in plasma virus is much less than in proviral DNA, again reflecting selection and having no bearing whatever on the underlying mutation rate. Similarly, differences between different individuals must most likely reflect differences in viral dynamics, not apobec mutation. So he basically doesn't think that the mutation rate has much of a contribution from apobec. Yeah. So, and I think you know he also bring he's bringing up some really uh, insightful points, uh, showing the, his you know intimate knowledge here of the virology. So this idea of considering the cell population, so which cells are surviving, and which ones aren't, and how that could sort of color the sampling that you're doing of the viruses that then the authors of that paper were using to tally their mutations. I would say I think this also really nicely highlights. Um, some of the difference uh, that we find as, um, you know, we talked about this in the first episode, this idea of the functional synthesis combining experimental um, biology with evolutionary biology in new ways and some of the challenges that arise. So I would say in this case, you know, John Coffin here is focusing really on selection and what are the sources of the selection, whether that's um, the survival of the cell populations, whether that's um, the apobec hypermutation from the host and so forth. Whereas the authors of this paper are coming at this very much from a kind of a, a, a much more evolutionary perspective are trying to uh, use this technique of just counting up the stop mutations in order to get away from selection. So only sampling the mutations that shouldn't be selected against in a sense. And so um, I think, you know, there's some middle ground here where, um, well, first to say any study has its limitations. I think the authors were missing some of the, the key aspects of HIV biology. But the, what they're asking is not sort of, they're actually trying to disengage from selection by picking the stop mutations. Now, whether this is colored by ApoBec as well, because of the, um, as John points out, the um, trip codon to stop, that could potentially elevate those calculations. But I'm sure the authors would make a pretty strong um, counter you know, argument for why they think that this does bring something to the table. But again, I think really nicely pointing out that um, you know, even a simple virus that has um, a, a, what you might assume to be just kind of a sloppy polymerase and an easy mutation rate to measure, when you look at the biology, it becomes much more complex. I asked them just today whether any apobec changes get incorporated into virus particles, and he said probably very few. Yeah, yep. yeah, because they're all most of them are stop codons, and so <clears throat> yeah. So this is again why um, I mentioned before. This is why I've been trying to avoid HIV virology because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll leave but, it alone for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. No, no, but uh, it just highlights, I think, what a vibrant field it is, and yeah, uh, yeah and how things are still argued about um, vigorously in productive ways, which is but, ultimately yeah, what we're looking for. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's what science is about, right? Yeah, you have absolutely. Make, you make hypotheses and you test them and you discuss and you do some more. It's a wonderful field that I'm afraid many people don't understand because they're not in it. And that's why we do these podcasts, to try and give people a sense of what science is. Exactly right, Vincent. And it, as we come to the more kind of... Um, you know, loggerheads we come to are the arguments we can expose and sort of celebrate even. I think the um, the more accurate reflection we're giving of sort of the state of the art at the interface of a lot of evolutionary biology and experimental biology. Yep. Yeah. Well, today we move away from microbes, don't we? Yeah. And so now we're going to move, you know, we started the last episode, we spent some time talking about point mutation rates, which really is, uh, as I mentioned, a fundamental mechanism of evolutionary change. And so I thought it would be fun for a couple of reasons to move to another sort of fundamental mechanism of evolution, this time recombination. And so I'm assuming that most of our listeners are familiar with the idea of recombination and that we have, you know, just as sort of a general definition, um, the commonplace means of rearrangements of genetic material in genomes, which is essential for uh, chromosome segregation through meiosis, as we'll be talking about in some detail, for viability of um, organisms in general, kind of across the board. 
And so here we have another, you know, fundamental mechanism for promoting evolutionary change that we'll consider. Does uh, recombination happen just with DNA nails? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're coming with the big guns today, aren't you, Vincent? <laughs> I thought I always did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, what, that's what makes it fun. So the recombination we're talking about today, and uh, most recombination that people are consider is DNA to DNA, so the sister chromatids that come together. And in particular, we'll be looking at meiosis. Uh, does recombination happen between RNA and DNA? Or are you saying RNA and RNA? RNA and RNA, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm coming up blank on this. Do you? What, what, I think you might have some insight, though. Yeah, so there, you know, there are two kinds of RNA viruses, those with a, with a genome that's a single molecule, mm -hmm. and those that are segmented, right? Mm -hmm. Like influenza virus. Mm -hmm. And the segmented ones just reassort their RNAs. They shuffle them. So there's no actual recombination there. We call it reassortment. But yeah. the viruses with single RNA molecules, they do recombine. And um, a VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, is one example that pops into my head. Mm. Pretty high uh, recombination rates. So yes, it does happen on RNA, and probably the mechanism is very different. Yeah, I think that's right. In terms of the general definition, though, of rearrangements in genetic material and genomes, it f I think it falls nicely. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, Nels, um, there's a term used in these paper, and and you mentioned it already. You called it meiotic recombination. Can you can you t tell us what that is, and is there a mitotic form as well? Yeah, definitely. So meiosis, right? So this is the process of um, genetic reduction when you go from a somatic cell to a germ cell. So going from um, the precursors of sperm and oocytes, for example. And so you start out with a diploid genome um, in the case of many eukaryotes, so our, uh, our species, for example. And then um, what happens is through uh, sort of some chromosomal gymnastics, you end up as a single haploid copy that has undergone recombination as part of that process. And so this form of uh, recombination that we'll be focusing on um, is at where recombination is actually essential. So it is true in sort of mitotic scenarios where you just, is, which is basically, you could think of this as cells dividing kind of by uh, their, as cells normally do, um, with without the um, involvement of germline cells. In that case, uh, recombination can happen as well. Um, Slightly different process in terms of um, its importance for viability, but certainly a, definitely a huge source of genetic variability. In fact, in my lab, we uh, think a lot about viral recombination under, I guess, what you could consider cases of, um, you know, the equivalent of mitosis in large DNA viruses, where a lot of these recombination mechanisms that lead to copy number variation and so forth are, are pretty rampant. Now, when you have recomb somatic cell recombination occurring, in most cases, this will not be transmitted to offspring because it's not happening in a germ cell, right? Correct. But it could lead to, say, tumor formation, right? Absolutely. So sometimes you have translocation of oncogenes or other genes to where they should not be by recombination. It turns them on, and then eventually you have some kind of a tumor, right? Yeah, exactly. And then other cases where take an oncogene and say you go from one copy of that gene to 20 copies mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you've sort of turned up the volume, so to speak, on that uh, gene in terms of its expression and its sort of pro-cancer form. And so you, you, you can also get into a lot of trouble with unregulated mm -hmm. recombination in those scenarios. Now, in meiotic recombination, this is happening in the, uh, the germ tissues, right? Yes. So this would be ova and testes. And you said that Recombination is essential for meiosis. Now, can you explain that? Yeah. So if you kind of, if we turn the page back to maybe our junior high or high school biology textbook, and, you know, I, th I certainly <laughs> can try to dust this off from my memory of those, um, you know, those diagrams of, again, sort of the chromosomes arranging on mm -hmm. the, and then um, meeting up. And in fact, so the process of recombination, sort of these physical interactions between the DNA end up to be very important for the stability of the process as the chromosomes are then pulled apart um, throughout the, um, uh, the meiotic uh, stages. And when that goes wrong, if, if you have um, 
parts of the protein complex or machinery that are mediating recombination, what you quickly see are these states of um, sort of instability or aneuploidy, where now you're sort of segregating things improperly and things can go downhill pretty rapidly from there. Okay. Yeah. So the um, important thing about, a couple important things about recombination. So not only is this sort of a source of genetic variation again, um, as can be the case in a tumor cell or, um, you know, the offspring of two parents. Um, this is a process that has been uh, studied extensively, not only by molecular biologists and geneticists, again, owing to sort of its fundamental role in these key processes of cell division and reproduction, but has also been thought or has been considered by evolutionary biologists for many years as well, sort of on parallel and you could almost say separate tracks. And I think what's really exciting about today's papers that were just published in science, um, and we'll, we'll get to the details of that in a moment, is that we're starting again to see this confluence of um, molecular biology and genetics um, separate from evolution actually coming together in new ways. And so um, in terms of the molecular biology, a lot of the mechanics um, has been worked out in organisms like yeast. So yeast we don't commonly think of as being sexually reproducible reproducing organisms. But um, in the fungal life cycle or replication cycle, um, there are this, these stages of spore formation that are actually undergoing reductive meioses. Um, and some very fundamental principles have been worked out for you know, something like 30, 40 years, maybe even longer, um, with some of these model systems. And then on the evolutionary side, um, this has been a puzzle, actually, again, for 40 or more years of why do uh, organisms actually put up with sex? So when you think about it, um, things that just divide in terms of their strategy for reproducing have a massive advantage because uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, you take one genome and you make it into two genomes that are 100% identical to each other. And so that sort of maximizes um, your you know, pushing the genetics or the genes into the next generation. However, when you undergo sex, you're sort of giving up half of your genome to your partner. And so that's sort of, from an evolutionary standpoint, this massive trade-off where now, instead of getting 100% of your um, genetic material moving forward, only 50%. And so evolutionists have thought about this for a long time and why do uh, organisms sort of put up with this as a strategy of reproduction? And uh, sorry, yeah. You, you're saying put up with it's it's funny, right? <laughs> uh huh. Some putting people, up with sex. Some people like it. Well, <laughs> of course, there's some in yeast. They don't put up because they don't know one way or the other, right? But it's yeah. a funny way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Biology sometimes bends us into these pretzels, <laughs> <laughs> and it gets even more wild. So some of the ciliates have up to seven mating types. Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah. So now, is what fraction of organisms on Earth reproduce sexually? Do we know? Yeah, good question. Is it more I mean, than more than half? I think so. I mean, it depends on how how you sort of want to slice the the pie here. So, you know, if you go on strict biomass, I think I've heard estimates that insects are kind of you know far and away the heaviest organisms when you add them all together. Mm -hmm. They're all sexual, or at least uh, the vast majority are. Um, but then, when you think about sort of total numbers, right? So, uh, viruses or bacteria. So certainly we can, um, again, sort of, you know, bend in pretzels and think about recombination or the definition of sex in, in terms of rearrangements. Um, but those are generally considered non-sexual. So I'd say both strategies have actually been massively successful. Mm -hmm. but, what's, but what's really striking to evolutionary biologists is that sex stays around at all. That it's not totally outcompeted. And so this got a few people thinking about it. And one of the sort of major ideas for why sex persists is that there's actually a huge advantage in, in those rearrangements, that you make sort of novel combinations of um, genetic diversity that might be the difference between life or death for the offspring of these organisms. And so this actually leads into the origins of one of my favorite pet hypotheses, the Red Queen hypothesis. And this idea was first picked up by a few people, Bill Hamilton, William Hamilton, one of the more famous, uh, John Janicki, who's... Uh, still running up at University of Rochester. And their idea was that, so for a host species, which um, reproduces relatively, you know, sort of long generation times, very few offspring compared to the parasites 
the viruses, the bacteria, and other parasites that are sort of attacking or using the host as a, a means to reproduce, that the only way to survive this onslaught is actually to sort of get uh, more of an advantage of diversity generation through recombination that is offered through sexual interactions. And so this is kind of a really, I think, cool example of, the, of that concept we've been talking about, the functional synthesis, and the idea that we're starting to get sort of an evolutionary view for all of these fundamental biological processes that folks have been studying for a, a very long time. Have you read the book, The Red Queen? I've been meaning to. This is, is this the, um, it's Matt Ridley's book? Yeah. Yeah, I've been meaning to. I haven't actually dug in yet. You've read it? Yeah, a number of years ago. He's a, he's a very good British science writer, and um, the, the Red Queen is the only book of his I, I've written. He's written others, but it's all about this, uh, why organisms have sex, and uh, it's really interesting because he goes over the data in a nice way, and you know, it gets to the same issue that you've just mentioned, that in in many model systems, uh, having the the variation that's provided by sexual reproduction gives you resistance to parasitic infections. Yeah, viruses, bacteria, parasites, fungi, etc. Yeah, I love this idea because it kind of I mean it's one of my again favorite sort of pet hypothesis is that the pathogens all around us have had this really critical role in shaping our own biology. And that's actually kind of one of the or organizing principles of my lab and a lot of our efforts is to understand sort of the reach that these pathogens that we, you know, I don't think we always give them their fair due for what a um, important influence they have on our own species and all of the life around us, really. Well, of course, not only in selection, but they... Some of them are, are symbiotic with us, right? Commensals. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's another interesting topic that I think we'll pick up in um, some papers down the road is, um, and I have to confess up front that I may have some strong opinions um, not shared by uh, <laughs> everyone. Okay. Um, exactly. But this idea that um, even in what can look like very symbiotic scenarios or uh, commensal situations can turn very quickly into genetic conflicts um, as well. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, depending on your point of view, even the sort of most cooperative situations could have sort of these underlying layers of conflict that are sort of organizing it or, and make, make us to um, almost have these negotiated truces with the um, microbes that associate with us. Do you teach a course over there, Nels? Yeah, I do. Actually, I'm just giving an exam today to our first year graduate students in genetics and genomics. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the uh, class projects we've, we've been doing is to propose a genome project. And actually today's paper is, um, I think, a nice example of that, where you, where you will see in the first paper how using genome scale data can get you to sort of new insights about um, important biology. I also teach a little bit um, uh, on evolution, um, but sort of in smaller doses. We have a... Um, Evo Devo course or um, evolutionary development course uh, where we talk about some of these ideas of genetic conflict, Red Queen, and so forth as well. I was going to say, if you teach a evolution course, you could use this podcast as part of the course, right? Yeah, now we're talking kind of two birds with one stone. Well, you could, you, we could do papers that you know are part of your course, and then the students can listen, and then you guys could talk about it in class some more and that sort of thing. Make it yeah. useful in many levels, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. And in fact, this paper we'll be talking about next um, I think I'll take your great idea and use it as an example um, for future classes as they're thinking about their genome projects that they might want to um, propose and how genome scale analysis, again, can kind of get us to sort of new insights about biology. Right, good. Do you, uh, how about you, Vincent? For your course, do you cover recombination as one of the topics that comes up? Uh, we we mention it briefly. I, I do a lecture on evolution. Mm-hmm. And it's part of the uh, diversity generation uh, mechanisms, both reassortment and recombination. And we talk about one of the proposed mechanisms, which is copy choice, where enzymes you know, are copying one template and they move then to another, and then you get a recombinant molecule. Yeah. Yeah, I think, again, highlighting just sort of how fundamental this is. You, it's hard to go too far in biology without running into recombination at some, in some flavor or another. Yep. Yep. Recombination, mutation, and reassortment. Those are the big guys. Yeah. 
there you go. A lot of di- <laughs> <laughs> a lot of diversity uh, underlying those mechanisms. Okay, well maybe we should dive into yeah. the paper. Yeah. So to begin, it'll be a tiny bit of background, and it's actually sort of you know a left turn almost. So when we were thinking about recombination, um, especially in eukaryotes and in our own, out through our own species, there's one protein that has been gaining a lot of attention, I would say, in the last decade or so. And this is another one of those alphabet bet soup guys. This is PRDM9, which stands for PR Domain Zinc Finger 9 Protein. Have you heard of this guy before? I have never heard of it. And I was going to ask you, you know, in what context was this discovered? Yeah, so actually, um, the dis- the original discovery had, again, uh, a really interesting evolutionary sort of slant to it. So people are also very interested in this question of what makes two species from one, the idea of speciation, or when, mm-hmm. as you know, diverse genetic diversity accrues, at some point, one species becomes two, you're no longer compatible. And so people have been looking at a lot of model systems to try to get at some of the genetic basis of this. I bet we will uh, return to this in future episodes as well, this idea of speciation. But for today's podcast, the important point is people were looking at very closely related separate species of mice. So this is Mus musculus, the famous house mice, mouse, and uh, even a subspecies. So I think it's Mus musculus domesticus, which is different from Mus musculus musculus. It gets the kind of uh, t- tongue twister there. And so when these guys are mated together, um, if they can have offspring, the offspring are often sterile. And that's because their germ cells fail um, at the process of recombination. And so as people were mapping the genetic basis of this, what's called a hybrid incompatibility, they landed on this gene I called see. PRDM9. And so what it turns out is that this protein... Um, is and its exact function is still again an active area of research, um, both in sort of recombination biology and also evolution. But it's this rapidly evolving protein that recognizes DNA, so it makes a protein DNA interaction. And when it interacts with DNA, part of the protein has an enzymatic function, which is to methylate the histone proteins that are associated with the DNA in that location in the genome. And somehow these methylation marks on a specific histone protein called histone 3 lead to recruit the recombination machinery or the complex of proteins that mediate double-strand breaks that are sort of the first step of recombination. Mm. And so basically humans and mice and uh, other mammals have um, sort of given this important role in a sense, to PRDM9 to pick out the locations where recombination will happen. Hmm. Now, Nels, they say in this paper, giving a little background on PRDM9, that in mammals, the gene evolves quickly with evidence of positive selection on residues that contact DNA. Yeah, so really interesting. So, and this is, it's actually, this is another active area of research where we don't know sort of the basis of why this protein is undergoing repeated rapid evolution. So positive selection means you, certain residues are dominant at certain positions? Yeah, so positive selection is the signature that, so basically it looks like at the, in this case, at the protein sequence level, that you're fixing mutations or making changes that are positively selected for. That's Im- implying that there's sort of this inherent advantage to making a change. Um, and then when you see this recurring again or again, then that's where it sort of falls into this interesting category of proteins um, that are often involved in some genetic conflicts in one case. That's not thought to be going on with PRDM9. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but that there's other um, sort of uh, biology here, most likely related to the recombination and the dynamics of that. So it turns out, as we'll get into um, the nitty gritty of it here, in uh, re- where the locations of recombination are happening in many genomes, our own included, is constantly changing. And so if you look at two individuals of our species, what you might find is that basically our recombination machine is picking different places to cause these double strand breaks and to undergo recombination. So if you compared you with me, you would find different sites of recombination? Yeah, I think we would. So certainly if we went out to our next common um, 
relative that's extant relative, the chimpanzees, it's only 10% of sites are sort of shared. Mm-hmm. Whereas even among um, at the population level, there are already differences accruing. And so one idea is that basically that positive selection that's being read out in PRDM9 is sort of a reflection of all of the changes that are happening in terms of recombination sites that are changing uh, on the DNA side. And PRDM9 is somehow you know, playing catch up or keeping up with identifying or binding to uh, locations that are constantly changing. And that, yeah, go ahead. So, there are only four bases, so I don't understand how you know positive selection of PRDM9 would let you go around to different parts of the genome. Yeah, so great question. So if you look at the um, composition of PRDM9, so part of its name, this PR domain zinc finger. So if we look at the zinc finger uh, motifs, this is a collection of DNA binding um, regions on the uh, on the protein, and it's actually a very repetitive um, region of the protein. So you have um, these motifs, I think there's something like a dozen of them, but that itself is very evolutionary dynamic. So some copies of PRDM9 and some individuals will have, you know, let's say a dozen of these motifs. Someone else might have nine motifs. Someone mm-hmm. else has 15. Um, again, certainly cl- very clear by comparing species, but could even be happening at the population level um, among uh, individuals and populations. And so it turns out it's the combination of these motifs that are then recognizing different stretches of the A, T, Cs, and Gs that are in different combinations. Hmm. So it's almost like um, a code for, for the zinc fingers to read out where there's this specificity encoded depending on um, how you arrange and even the diversity within these motifs. And so this is another cool example of where... Um, Geneticists have been trying to take advantage of these natural systems. So as, as these zinc fingers have been doing their sort of day jobs or their functions in the cell, genetic engineers have been pulling this out, learning the code, and then rearranging or engineering, genetically engineering zinc fingers in order to target regions of the genome we're interested in altering. Um, and so some of the first um, gene editing techniques were done with zinc fingers, and then people sort of moved to another technique using talons, which is another um, protein DNA recognition system happening as pl- in plant defense to um, pathogens. And then now we've moved to a bacterial immune system, the CRISPR system that's getting all of the attention today because it has some advantages over the talons or the zinc fingers in terms of doing the DNA targeting with proteins. So Nels, if, uh, how long does it take to positively select the residue? So if, say, in this, in this uh, PRDM9 gene, an amino acid arises by mutation, right, just spontaneously, and yeah. it turns out to be good for the host, how long would it take for that to yeah, be fixed? Yeah, it's a great question, and it really depends on how much of an advantage that mutation is over all of the other guys in the population. So there's this idea of the selection coefficient. So if it basically means everyone else will die and I will live, mm. That just takes the time for everything else to die. Real life is, you know, much much more complex and subtle. And so, um, in some of these cases, it could take millions of years for these things to fix. In the case of PRDM9, it's somewhere in between. So the only way right now we can study this is to look at related species on a phylogenetic tree and see if we can get some evidence for this, right? For this fixing. Yeah, that's right. So doing um, sequence comparisons, uh, phylogenetics. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there's a paper from about six years ago from um, Chris Ponting's lab over in the UK, um, along with my postdoc advisor, Harmeet Malik, and uh, looking at this exact question using phylogenetics. And that was sort of one of the first reports that PRDM9 was under rapid evolution. So you said PRD9 is, PRDM9 is a mammalian gene. Anybody else have this? Yeah, great. So now we're kind of, this is where today's paper gets pretty interesting. So it was kind of assumed, so right, we have this mouse data that PRDM9 can be the basis of a species incompatibility between two very closely related um, mouse subspecies. And the idea here is that it's rapidly evolving so fast that those changes, when you then cross that in to another um, mouse species, it no longer works um, to sort of line up all of the recombination that has to happen in these germ cells and you end up with these sterile offspring. Um, so on the one hand, because we saw it in mouse, and then this is also um, known to be happening in humans, 
one of the first assumptions is that, wow, this is just sort of how certainly mammals do this and maybe all animals do this. Um, but then what we're finding to today's paper or the main topic of today's paper is that there are, we're incre increasingly recognizing that there are many organisms, many species, maybe the majority that actually don't have PRDM9 and that the more ancestral state was recombination without PRDM9. And so that's sort of the big question here is what happens in these cases? Do we see sort of the rapid evolution that's characterized or these what we'll be calling recombination hotspots in genomes that are constantly shuffling around? Or is it a more stable scenario for most of the other species? Do we know of any human diseases associated with changes in PRDM9? Yeah, that is known. Um, and in fact, sterility. So the, hmm. uh, the, same, the same issue when you cross those mice. However, I th we just, so the um, senior author of the paper that we'll be looking at today, Molly Przeworski, I'm really butchering her name, Molly Przeworski, um, who's your colleague at Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, she was here last week at Utah, um, which is one of the reasons I thought it would be fun to tackle this paper was just having that this sort of fresh on my mind and being really excited from hearing her tell the story in person. Um, she was uh, pointing out some human cases where um, uh, people who actually have a mutation in PRDM9 but are somehow not sterile. And that was really surprising because then it sort of, again, suggests that there's more going on to the biology here than what we currently understand. Wow. Well, there's always another way to do something, though. True. And the other, I think, general thing to remember about evolution is that just because we see sort of a complex process in place, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've sort of gained more efficiency or moved you know, along the process to something that works better or is somehow an improved or pinnacle scenario. It's just that these are the guys who survived and here's who's here today. So these individuals who have mutations in the PRDM9 gene, they are not going to pass that on because the offspring are sterile, right? I Correct. should say that their gametes that they make are not competent to, uh, to, to procreate. Correct. And so these are very rare sort of spontaneous mutations that are occurring. This is not something that's easily inherited and passed along. Hmm. All right. Yeah, so then for today's paper, we're not going to be spending so much time um, in the PRDM9 systems of mouse and human, but instead we're using now systems, um, and this is uh, birds, and in particular zebra finches and some related finches, um, and then yeast, um, the famous budding yeast, which has used, been used as a genetic model system for several scientific generations now to tackle the idea of what do the recombination locations look like in species that do not have PRDM9. So kind of we kind of already hinted at this, but the mirror image of the rapid evolution of PRDM9 protein is the rapid evolution of DNA recombination hotspots and germlines. And this is actually considered um, a, or has been described as sort of the paradox of recombination hotspots which is that if you have a location in the genome which is subject to all kinds of recombination, then in the process of repairing those um, hotspots, that, um, so that process involves uh, taking an intact copy from the other chromosome and then basically writing over the um, hotspot region, that you'll end up with these so-called cold spots or regions that are not sort of susceptible to recombination. And so the paradox is that just as soon as you find a place in the genome that's sort of very favorable for recombination, as that process plays out, it will become less and less favorable for recombination. And so that paradox is thought to underlie then sort of this, again, these dynamics where we're constantly changing the location of where recombination is happening. And so um, the question then became, or sort of the um, motivation for these papers was to say, okay, well, if PRDM9, which is potentially driving part of this sort of dynamic scenario, is not even there, do these, de do these recombination locations in the genomes, are they still hotspots that move around and are dynamic, or are they more stable? And I guess we'll give away the punchline, which is that both for birds and for yeast, they appear very stable in comparison to cases like mouse and human. So there's some other mechanism that's allowing recombination other than PRDM9, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, because recombination is essential to get through meiosis, 
then you're going to have to do it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the um, first question that the Przeworski group decided to look at. And so it's kind of interesting. They decided to pick up the um, zebra finch. So, um, and why, you know, you might ask why finches. And so I think the, the choice was made for a couple of reasons. So first of all, um, we have been sort of fascinated in studying and have been studying the beautiful biology of finches for a long time. And in fact, all the way back to Darwin, right? So the famous Darwin finches with their um, very different beak morphologies to think about, you know, this idea of adapting to the food sources that are available. And so because of that, sort of just because Darwin picked that up and also for some other reasons, people have been interested in, in finches and their biology for a very long time. Also keeping these guys as pets, given their very colorful plumage and, and their small size. And so in terms of more recent genetic work, the genome of the zebra finch has been um, solved or has been sequenced and very well annotated. And so the group today, Molly's group, decided to um, first dive in and do um, a lot more sequencing. Um, so taking individuals now, in some cases, you know, 10 different individuals from the same species, 20 individuals from zebra finch. Uh, I think they did 19 wild and five domesticated individuals in order to start getting a lot more sequence um, from the genome so that they could make more powerful comparisons to get an idea of where recombination was happening. How do you get how do you get finches? Do you have, do you have to buy them or you have to catch them? Uh, I think a little of both. So the wild <laughs> <laughs> the wild guys were talking about catching them. Uh, um, where did she catch them? Did she say when she visited? Uh, she didn't mention that. That's a good question. Uh, she did. Um, she did mention a little some some of the backstory here on how they made some of their choices of which mm -hmm. species to pick. So part of the choices, both for the finch paper and the yeast paper, um, was to pick sort of. A, diversity of species that sort of matched the case for humans and mice so nice. that we could, so that they could make uh, at least a somewhat um, reasonable comparison between if you have a certain amount of divergence and then an expectation for the stability of sites of recombination, how much they would overlap or not overlap. And so that was part of the choice. The other um, choice they made, so they um, ended up sequencing 10 long-tailed finches and 10, um, uh, or, or Two, I should say 20 long-tailed finches from two different species. And part of the reason they picked the two species was because they have different color beaks. And so they were curious if they were able to, by comparing the genomes, actually get to the genetic basis of why one of the species has a red beak and one of them has a yellow <laughs> beak. Uh, kind of a fun side project. Uh, she said, unfortunately, they couldn't get to it. There were just too many changes to try to get to the basis. Yeah. Okay, but then kind of more importantly for the recombination question, they wanted to have all of these um, genomes to get a sense of the diversity here so that they could start making comparisons of where is recombination happening and does that basically overlap whether you're, it's another guy in your population or if it's a species that's been diverging from a last common ancestor for a very long time, in some cases millions of years. So uh, how big is the genome of the finch? Do you know offhand? Ooh, I don't. That's a great question. I think it's, you know, a fairly regular size mammalian genome. Billion, so we're talking billion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I think this is a lot of work. Yeah. And so this really does it all I agree. And it also highlights sort of how far we've come in the last ten years from, you know, a state of affairs where doing the human genome project or even the original zebra finch project was a massive undertaking. Yeah. And now with, you know, Illumina sequencing technology, some of the other next-gen platforms, you can really kind of knock these things out. It's still not um, simple, and I don't want to underestimate or underrepresent how much work it takes and resources to do it, but it's really becoming much more accessible and sort of democratized, which is really exciting. Nels, when I, when I was a postdoc, my project was to sequence the genome of poliovirus. Yeah, I love it. 7,442 nucleotides. It was yep. among the first viral genome sequenced. It took me one year. There you go. By it myself, one year. <laughs> I love it. So, and were you using the um, those large shark <laughs> shark tooth comb gels and yes. the S thirty five huge the... huge gels? Yeah, like a like a I don't know two feet wide and a meter long. I'm yep. mixing my measurements there. How about that? And um, we used P thirty two. To yep. uh, label the DNA, so I use the Maxim and Gilbert 
uh, technique to uh, sequence the DNAs. Yeah, I always like to tell people that because um, nowadays it would take 10 minutes probably to do that. Yeah, and so it, you're right. It does, well, 10 minutes, maybe even less. And then at scale, we can go even farther. However, the, the cool thing is, Nels, that yeah. you know that's how we used to do science. We would study one virus or one finch. Now you can study hundreds of thousands because you can sequence them all, right? Absolutely. Although I, I will offer kind of a note. I don't want to throw cold water on our conversation, but I will offer a note of caution, which is sequencing is great and it's absolutely mind boggling the progress we've made. But then there's still challenges out there. Annotation is a big one, right? right and so right. if you have, especially when you have, we are just sort of flooded with data, you know, billions and billions of nucleotides to sort of sift through and actually figure out what's meant to go where and what does this all mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I talked to a guy <laughs> from CDC who yeah. is sequencing, you know, bacteria they get from various outbreaks. Yeah. And they do tons of, bacterial genomes, right? He generates terabytes of data routinely. And yeah. I said, you know, I asked him jokingly, do you back it up? And he laughed. He said, we can't even <laughs> figure out how to copy it from one <laughs> computer to another. And I said, no wonder the internet is slow. Exactly. <laughs> I cool. love it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> By the yep. way, Nels, yeah. they went to Australia to capture these finches. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So they really were in the wild yeah. um, in order to get them. That's right. Um yeah, so every time we solve one problem in biology, we create another, whether it's um, you know terabytes of data or annotations or this and that. Do you do a lot of sequencing? We do a fair bit. And actually, one of the fun projects we're doing now is a new technology that's sort of on the cusp, I think, of being useful, which is the Oxford Nanopore platform. Mm -hmm. And so talk about you know your meter by two-foot gels um, here we're, we've got a, a, we've got a harmonica sized device that we squirt a little DNA into. It's plugged into the USB of our laptop, and basically it's um, these nanopores with DNA fragments shooting through, just changing the sort of the electric current slightly, and increasingly powerful computational and uh, engineering approaches to interpret the uh, identity of the nucleotides going through those nanopores. So we're playing around with that right now with some large DNA viruses, the pox viruses, and stay tuned. I think we might have some cool stuff to share. You know, we could do your work one of these days on uh, when you yeah. publish a paper on yeah. something yeah. cool, right? And now we're talking. So and I've got good news on that front. So we've got a, um, or hopefully in, in the not too long future, we got back some reviews last week that were very positive. And so we've got a big story that um, hopefully will be coming out in the next few months. And I can't wait to... Um, to present it or share it with the crew on Twivo. I think it will fit nicely into our, our, our lineup. Cool. Okay, but now let's get back for a I'm few sorry, minutes. I'm sorry I divert you all the time, man. No, I love it. I mean, <laughs> it's, our, it's our listeners that we might have to, uh, <laughs> we'll see if they, how long they'll stick with us. But um, no, let's get back for a few minutes into recombination. Um, and actually, so there's, in terms of the, you know, a, a really sort of Herculean task of getting a lot of sequences together and dealing with it. I think we can actually move pretty fastly, pretty quickly um, over what are the ways that they are actually using this genome scale data set, um, you know, 50 or so genomes to ask questions about the stability or the um, dynamics of recombination locations. Mm -hmm. And so they leaned on two techniques to infer where recombination was happening in the genomes of these finches. So the first is sort of a, um, a mouthful, uh, and it's a, it's a key concept or idea in population genetics, which is the idea of linkage disequilibrium. Mm. And so very simply defined, this is the non-random association of variants at different locations in a genome. And so in thinking about recombination, the idea here, these, you sometimes you'll hear... Um, evolutionists talking about blocks of linkage disequilibrium. And this is the, the idea that sort of, you know, as recombination is happening and you're scrambling genomes, it's happening in blocks. So it's over, and it can be over very long distances if there is uh, low levels of recombination. And if things are inherited in blocks, basically these, you get a non-random association of variants. So if you look at two locations within a recombination zone, 
um, they will start to associate with, with each other until enough recombination happens that they're sort of broken apart. And then now sort of all combinations of variants can occur at that location or that they're, another way of saying it is that they're sort of those blocks are broken up into smaller blocks. And so basically based on the amount of non-random associations, that gives you a proxy for how much recombination is happening. And so they used a program um, that is basically going through at a genome wide, it's making a lot of calculations accounting for sort of the divergence among the individuals in the populations they're sampling, but trying to um, calculate a value, which is the recombination rate based on uh, how often genetic variants are sort of associated with each other in nearby genomic locations or how often that, that's, that signal is totally scrambled. And so by doing this, they actually start to get some signal. It's a, um, in the paper, they um, refer to this uh, value as P, and it's the population-scaled recombination rate between pairs of sites. And so what you can basically then do is just march along the chromosome and measure a value P for each location, which basically is m the intent is that you're getting an indication of how often recombination is happening in certain locations. Is this done on a base pair level or bigger? Um, sort of both. So bigger in terms of, in order to consider the blocks of genetic variants, um, you have to do uh, bigger comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, but then ultimately you're also taking into account uh, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms or so the variation that's happening on the single base pair level as well. Because wouldn't that confuse you? Because you're looking at 20 finches that you got from Australia, right? And you say you look at a KB gene or, or so, so you're going to have random changes anyway, right? Correct. And so that's, um, you know, some of that's some of the noise that's in the data set as well. So, yeah. And so that's, again, that sort of goes into some of the experimental design of having not just five inches, but 10 inches, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that they really um, bear down on. So you basically have to look at the patterns of, of, of changes between the different individuals and dissect the ones that are just mutations from where you can see blocks of sequence being exchanged. Exactly right, and so because that's you know you're in, you're you're inferring a process with somewhat indirect evidence. Right. Um, that spurred them to take a second measure that can also be consistent with recombination happening and at higher frequencies in certain locations, and that's it's a it's a very simple measure. It's actually um, the frequency of GC in a stretch of sequence. So again, going back to the ATs, Cs, and Gs of DNA. Um, what's been known for a long time is that in sites in a genome where recombination is happening quite frequently, uh, the GC level or frequency increases. And this is sort of just a natural kind of um, outcome of the, enzy the enzymology of double-strand breaks being repaired by recombination mm -hmm. is that when you're fixing or repairing the um, gaps or the breaks that occur, that um, it just turns out with the chemistry that Gs and Cs are sort of more commonly uh, replaced in those areas. And so this is sort of a second proxy um, is that as GC content is slightly higher, that this can be re reflective of a higher frequency of recombination. And so because neither of these measures is perfect, but they're somewhat independent, um, what they did was um, correlate basically the locations of the genome for GC frequency um, as well as the measures of linkage disequilibrium. And they saw a pretty nice correlation, actually. And so that gave them some confidence that they were actually um, had some signal to actually sort of infer where recombination is happening more frequently in these genomes. Right. So what was the answer? Yeah. And so then once they've sort of mapped where are these sites, then you can start asking, is there something, you know, yeah. a pattern here or something that's so on two levels? So one is there... Um, you know, how much difference is there between organisms or do kind of all of these individuals in different species share the same sites in the genome? And then whether or not that happens, where are these sites? And so the first to answer the second question first, what they saw was that most of the sites um, of recombination that they were inferring are located near uh, transcriptional start sites. Mm. And this is sort of consistent with the idea that... Um, you know, the genome is generally packed really tightly into chromatin. And in order to undergo the double strand breaks and then recombination, the genome has to open up enough so that 
these enzymes can basically come in and attack the DNA. If it's all wrapped up with proteins, it might not be very accessible. And so it's the one idea is that this is almost like sort of a default switch mm. where, where the genes are being opened up to undergo transcription and gene expression, um, the recombination machinery can also get in there. And so the, not only did they see sort of this preponderance of the high-frequency recombination sites being near so-called open chromatin where transcription is happening, um, but in addition to that, it was remarkable how overlapping it was, whether they were comparing individuals within a species of zebra finch or comparing between zebra finch and long-tail finch or even comparing to um, some of Darwin's Galapagos finches um, and then either, I think I forget the most distant um, bird species they looked at. Um, but even out to that distance, they were still seeing a, a, a stable overlap, which is sort of the main conclusion of the paper. And, of course, it's not surprising because these are transcriptional start sites and you can't be moving those around, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, <laughs> the, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> you can, but th those generally move in block, functional blocks, yeah, right? And, yeah. so, and so that, again, even if you start to lose what's called syntony, which is sort of the location of one gene next to another, mm -hmm. if you still have enough, um, you know, of a block of sequence together, um, these that could still be defined as a stable site in that case as well. So this is different from what you had mentioned earlier about mammals where the combination sites change because PRDM changes, right? Yeah, exactly. So this looks, it's in sharp contrast to our own genomes and genomes of um, our primate relatives and uh, our rodent relatives. So in, the, in these cases, if you try to do that same overlap, so if we took, you know, 10 human individuals or 10 mus musculus uh, mouse individuals and then tried to uh, run, ran the same algorithms to identify high frequency recombination spots and then try to do the overlay, they wouldn't match nearly as closely. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's as if that addition of PRDM9 has really ramped up the case, you know, for, in, in terms of recombination where it's happening um, in those other species. So you have to ask whether having PRDM9, is that the right number? Yeah, PRDM9 <laughs> doesn't really flow off the tongue, yeah. whether that's of any benefit, because birds do pretty well without it, right? Yeah, and again, that's one of the kind of really fun mysteries right now, is what's going on here? Is there some inherent advantage, or is this just some strange scenario where this somehow came online um, and then has stuck around, but if we come back in a few million years, will PRDM9 be gone, or is there some kind yeah, of cr yeah. cryptic advantage? And that's, I think that's kind of puts us right up to the frontier of a question that um, several groups are chasing uh, even as we speak. So aren't birds uh, quite old as a species, right? They're derived from dinosaurs, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and coming at it from an evolutionary perspective, so the authors of this paper um, actually spent some time looking at uh, reptiles, so sort of the uh -huh. you know, extant versions of dinosaurs, um, because of that um, old relationship with birds as well. And so as you know, now as they're sampling around more and more genomes, what they're seeing is that PRDM9 might actually be the exception rather than the rule when it comes to mm. the process of recombination. And that kind of, um, I think, very nicely um, segues into the second paper, which is actually going even farther out the evolutionary tree to um, budding yeast. And so the authors, separate authors of this paper, also in New York, I think they're at, um, this is Scott Kenny's lab, I think it's at um, Sloan Kettering, right. yep. Yep. in your backyard there. Um, they did a very similar study um, as the Finch study, but in yeast. And in fact, because they're using the um, you know organism where a lot of meiotic recombination has been defined over 30, 40 years, they're able to take advantage of some of the um, experimental tools there that you have in yeast that are missing from finches. And so in order to define the sites of recombination in the yeast species that now are kind of have the same level of divergence as the bird species we've been talking about, they took one of the recombination enzymes called SPO11. Stands, I think it stands for sporulation 11 for longhand, which is the process of meiosis in yeast forming spores. They took that protein and cross-linked it to the DNA 
Um, and then we're and then sequenced all of these cross-linked fragments to really kind of more precisely define where the breakpoints are. And so what's nice is actually, even though they were using a completely different method, mm. they got very similar results to the bird paper, which is they saw all of these high-frequency sites of recombination were near transcription start sites, a lot of them in promoters, and again, were very stable. And so yeast, like birds and like most reptiles and perhaps most animals don't have PRDM9. And so now it's sort of this theme that's emerging kind of from the evolutionary perspective or taking that viewpoint that's sort of working out, you know, what sort of business as usual for recombination versus um, kind of the um, additional accoutrements that uh, our species and a few others like rodents have added with PRDM9. So this is, uh, SPO11 is is one of the proteins that actually initiates the break in the DNA, I think, right? That's exactly right. And this is a great uh, approach to ask, you know, you really cut back the amount of sequencing you have to do, right? You don't have yeah. to do the whole genome. You just sequence the pieces of DNA that are associated with SPO11. Exactly. And I love this because it really, it kind of shows you the different approaches that people take depending on their biological system. So whereas the yeast geneticist might lean on sort of the all of the tools and resources that have been developed for the last 50 plus years, which give you these sort of really nice insightful ways to do your experiments, the population geneticists, they're sort of out there you know, in the Australian bush catching these finches, <laughs> which is really cool and exciting and actually reflects, you know, some of the true, true biology and diversity that's around us. But then they are using these increasingly sophisticated algorithms to infer, basically. And so it's really cool, I think, how you just have these very different approaches um, to biology, the functional synthesis here, both experiments and evolution, sort of converging on the same answers. And to me, this is what makes this field so much fun um, as it's being practiced currently, is just seeing all of these different approaches sort of coming together and leading us to new and exciting insights. So... In in our first episode, we talked about how this is a new evolutionary biology, the merging with molecular biology. And we, we mentioned how for years, you know, evolutionary biologists went out and collected things and cataloged them. But, and they still do that, but now they sequence their genomes. Yeah. And then and that, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> they do. And then they hit those genomes with increasingly sort of, you know, sophisticated yeah. tools. And then what's even more exciting, I think, is as we're looking, you know, we're talking about PRDM9 is this zinc finger protein where you can harness now some of these functions to actually start making experimental manipulations onto some of the more kind of ecologically relevant systems. And again, it's just sort of this kind of watershed time for biology where there's just all of these new possibilities to sort of tackle all of the beautiful diversity around us and to understand it uh, to a, at a new level. Um, using the ex new experimental tools and all of the genomic resources all kind of coming together at the same time. I'd like to read this last sentence of the yeast paper. Get, yeah. get your thoughts on it. It says, Thus, not only is it untrue that recombination initiation landscapes inevitably evolve rapidly, conservation is likely to be a common pattern for many sexual species. So was there this idea that um, recombination always evolved rapidly? Yeah, it was. And part of it is just because of um, our myopic view sometimes of we just study what's in front of us and sort of make the <laughs> assumption that that's how everything works. And that's, you know, I think that's one of the things that came very naturally out of our model systems approach to genetics, yep. which is that we've, set, we've said, and I think it's, you know, it's been revolutionary and it's been highly valuable and I subscribe to it myself. But what we say is that because we all had a last, last common ancestor, whether that's yeast or um, you know, Drosophila fruit flies or a mouse, that when we look and see all the genetic conservation, we sort of assume that something we study in yeast will apply to humans. And what we're finding as we go deeper and deeper is that that's not really true. If we really kind of sample all of biological diversity, um, the choices we've made for kind of the narrow slice of model systems only represents um, a small amount of the biology that's actually out there. And in a lot of cases, we've picked outliers, uh, including ourselves, mm. if we kind of compare that to all of biodiversity. Now, so what do you think of this protein PRDM9, which is has all these zinc finger domains, which are rapidly evolving? Yeah, does that suggest that they may not be involved in the actual function of this protein? Yeah, so that's where, you know, I think the, the um, there, 
several hypotheses that are, again, actively being tested. But I think my favorite hypothesis is that, in fact, we are seeing something related to this process of um, kind of the dynamics of recombination happening in um, our genomes. And that's this idea that, you know, so as you go from these hot spots of recombination to cold spots, PRDM9 has to land somewhere um, in order to kind of get to a threshold level of recombination that allows you to undergo successful meiosis. And so basically, if we kind of step back and think about it from just, you know, as mutations are being sampled, um, if, you, if PRDM9 is not changing, then what will happen is it potentially is not and, and as recombination sites are changing, going from those cold spots, or sorry, hot spots to cold spots, just via the process of recombination and repair, then if PRDM9 stays the same, it will start to not recognize the places that it's just been sort of promoting recombination. Mm -hmm. And then the, the danger is then it's l reaching a threshold where there's just not enough recombination happening. The genome becomes... Um, unstable as you're undergoing chromosome segregation. And if so, if PRDM9 stays the same and mutations aren't sampled, those individuals are sort of lost from the population because they'll no longer be fertile. Their offspring won't have kids. Mm -hmm. And so that could be the impetus for rapid evolution because it's such a strong selective pressure. Not reproducing from an evolutionary standpoint is an absolute dead end. And so the fact that we see this rapid evolution at this interface could suggest that something dramatic like that is going on. If there are, if you are sampling mutations at the population level, you'll select very quickly because these are the folks that uh, end up having offspring that are fertile. So I think this is very cool that the very raw material of evolution, mutation, recombination, reassortment, these themselves are evolving. Yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> and it's, <laughs> I agree completely. And, you know, for me, it just brings sort of that textbook early high school, middle school, just when I was looking at those diagrams and it just, everything felt so textbook. It was just, okay, this is what happens right, right. and everyone does it and it's this fundamental process and it never changes. And yet what we're discovering as we're looking more closely is that no, things are really dynamic and changing all of the time, even at, for these things that are completely essential. For me, this is just really fun. I think that science has to be taught differently because, yeah, you can't just put up this diagram and say, this is the way it is, and then students go, ah, it's figured out. Why do we have to go into science, right? Exactly. <laughs> and so we need, you know, we need animations, we need things flying around, you know, CGI, Pixar-level stuff to really, I think, capture <laughs> some of the, the uh, activity that's going on here. When I get questions in my virology course, you know, students don't like it when you say this is not known, right? So yeah. what you do is says, this is a great question, and here are all the things we think might be going on and why they do this, and then you make it exciting, right? That's that's the key. Yeah, and by doing that, we're, I think, more accurately reflecting what biology is all about. Yeah. Yeah. Nice set of papers, Nels. Good job. Thank you. This is this has been fun. New stuff. I, I didn't... Yeah, I did one other Finch paper on a podcast, Mm. And I believe when the zebra finch genome was was done, they found hepatitis B viral DNA fragments integrated in it. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember this actually. So my colleague across the hallway, Cedric Fischat, is mm -hmm. sort of a viral endogenous retrovirus and retrotransposon hunter. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty exciting finding. Yeah, so that allowed you to date how old these viruses were because they had a lot of uh, phylogeny for finches of various sorts and lots of sequences, so... They could tell exactly when it went in millions and millions of years ago. Yeah, exactly. A huge surprise, right? When we think about how fast viruses adapt and change, and yet if you look at these ones that have been quote-unquote fossilized in the genome, it looks pretty similar to what we're dealing with today. Yeah, that was pretty remarkable, but I think um, they're much, much older, and then in, in that case, you don't recognize them anymore because they're so old. I agree with you. It's a, it's a good point. Shall we do some picks, Nels? Yeah, let's do it. So my pick of the week is another sort of corner, I think, of exciting biology that's starting to be tackled with um, genome-scale approaches and genome projects. So these are the tardigrades. Have you heard of these guys before? I certainly have. <laughs> They're so cool looking. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to love them. So also known as the water bears. These are little micro animals. I just looked up. They're about half a millimeter. And I'll put a link. There's a great article by Ed Young, one of my favorite science writers, a British guy who's 
now working for the Atlantic magazine. And he just covered, uh, it just came out yesterday, covered uh, the draft genome that was just published in PNAS um, of the water bear, of tardigrades. Hmm. And so he has a beautiful picture at the top and then a really sort of captivating article about sort of the crazy stuff they found in the genome. And so what's really exciting about this, uh, and it's worth looking at the Atlantic piece, it's worth looking at um, the paper itself, but in the genome, it's actually only um, 80% pure tardigrade in terms of the genetic <laughs> material. The other 20% are genes or genetic material from bacteria, plant, fungi, fungi, and viruses. So almost wholly 20% of the genome has been acquired from other sources, this process of horizontal gene transfer. That's amazing. Is that the most that we know of? For an animal, that is pretty wild. And in fact, it's why it's it's a, a, a eukaryote, multicellular eukaryote. To have that much foreign DNA, it's actually caused some of my colleagues some pause. Do they really believe it? Is there, and you know, one of the things that you have to be ultra careful about in these genome projects, especially as you're looking for horizontal gene transfer, mm. which is more commonly um, observed in bacteria. Um, is that you have contamination. And so the authors went to some very, uh, you know, kind of careful extent to try to uh, minimize the possibility that they were getting fooled. Um, or what did John Coffin say that uh, uh, at the top of the hour? I'm afraid you got taken in on this one. Got so, taken in, that's right. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So the authors, and we'll still see, <laughs> this has been out for a day if we get taken in on this. But um, that is the idea, that this is, and, and why I think it's a... a, a viable for pick of the week is that it's really unusual to see that much foreign genetic material in a eukaryote. Do they have any idea how this might have been acquired? Yeah, so I w would definitely recommend reading this Atlantic piece. And there are, so they have some interesting hypotheses. One thing about these tardigrades is they can actually go without food or water for 10 years. <laughs> and then, I mean, again, this is just really fascinating biology, right? Um, and so one idea is because they kind of give back so much of their water and the, uh, so the osmotic sort of considerations uh, that under the, with this sort of a scenario is that somehow they, because they squeeze out their water, that somehow now they become sponges for picking up foreign genetic material, foreign genes. Uh, kind of a you know provocative idea, whether they're, that holds water, so to speak, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Where do you find tardigrades? Everywhere? I think that's right. So they live on like moss and, you know, kind of in ponds and so forth. Um, and because they're half a millimeter, they're just sort of right under our nose and we kind of ignore them all the time. But they're there just sort of hanging out, these tough little critters. They pictures kind of remind me of uh, dust mites. Yeah. Um, well, and the dust mites that are sort of have like a hunched bear, like kind of polar bear look to yeah. them, right? It's called, they're called water Yeah, bears. you can find lots of scanning electron micrographs of them. They're popular because they yeah. make them look huge and scary, right? <laughs> Pretty charismatic for a microbe, yeah. right? It's cool. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? Well, I have a, my pick is an article published today in the New York Times, November 24th. And you, you, you will probably be hearing this podcast well after that date. True. Nevertheless, it is worth going back. It is by Dennis Overby, and it's called A Century Ago, Einstein's Theory of Relatively, Relativity Changed Everything. hundred years ago, this week, Einstein came up with his theory of general, or I should say, his general theory of relativity. Yeah. And it changed the way we looked at the universe. In fact, the article actually says it changed the universe, but the universe didn't change. It was just the way we looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> good. I think that is a very good point. But this starts out, by the fall of 1915, Albert Einstein was a bit grumpy. And why not? Cheered on to his disgust by most of his Berlin colleagues, Germany had started a ruinous world war. He had split up with his wife and she had decamped to Switzerland with his sons. He was living alone. He sleeps until he's awakened. He stays awake until he is told to go to bed. He will go hungry until he is given something to eat, and then he eats until he is stopped. Worse, he had discovered a fatal flaw in his new theory of gravity. So what did he do? He went back to the blackboard, and on November 25th, 1915, he set down the equation for the general theory of relativity. Wow. So for all of you who are kind of depressed, things aren't going your way, you know, just get back to it. That's right. And I think, I mean, what a, um, obviously, um, people have 
uh, not only celebrated Einstein's discoveries, but also celebrated his style of science, right? Bringing all this creativity and I think a really open mind, um, just real imagination to science, which is sometimes I think we undervalue that. We bring yeah. sort of, you know, cold, hard analysis where in fact sort of, you know, tapping into the creative and imaginative parts of our brains can lead to the true <laughs> revolutionary breakthroughs. <laughs> Einstein being a, a, <laughs> a great example of that, also an outlier in terms of his For sure. no, intellectual he was, stature. He was, he was just an outlier, brilliant guy, but yeah, the article's full of cool stuff. For example, he uh, used a theory to calculate an, a puzzling anomaly in the motion of Mercury its orbit changes by 43 seconds of arc every century. And he put the numbers into his equation and it worked out. Mm. He said mm. Einstein had heart palpitations. <laughs> <laughs> they also have an article from the the London Times of 1915 saying that they could not figure out what his theory meant. <laughs> uh, yeah, another, <laughs> another great theme for science, right? Right. So there they admitted it. Uh, it was uh, nowadays. I'm not sure people are as admitting to not understanding things. I don't know why. But yeah, that's we, right. We should all admit. I certainly do when I don't understand things. Instead of being wrong and misleading people. Anyway, this is a cool article, and it's a hundred years ago. So check it out. Very and if, cool. And if you're a listener and you have a pick, send it in. You can send it to Twevo T W I E V O at microbe dot TV. In fact, if you have any questions or comments. You can send them to Twevo at microbe.tv. You can find Twevo at iTunes or at microbe.tv slash Twevo. I have made a brand new website, which hopefully will be up by the time you hear this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> microbe.tv, where I house all the podcasts that me and all my wonderful co-hosts do, including Twevo. Nels LD can be found at cellvolution.org and on Twitter E.L. Early Bird. Thank you, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. Fun as usual. Yeah, I have a good time and uh, a little interesting dynamic with two people. And um, I learned so much. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. I learned a ton as well. Thank you. And we'll, bring, we'll start bringing in some guests soon as well. Absolutely. Plenty of them out there. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music that you hear on Twevo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. Do turtles have, what's the name of that protein? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> PR, PRDM9? Yeah. They, they don't as reptiles. So actually the, the reptiles, first huh? paper looked at that. They looked at turtles and found no PRDM9. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then... Be curious.